Welcome to another Craftwork series adventure. This uh, bowling adventure is going to take us to Spain. Spain says old world. That's at least that's what it means to me. The mountains, the people, the villages, uh, everything about it is historic. And uh, for my first time ever, we're going to go after the uh, Ibexa. And you know, we have a dear friend and a new friend, Giuseppe, who is an outfitter here in Spain, has uh, been very, very successful, knows all the species here in Spain, and he's going to uh, be a personal guide on this adventure. We'll try for four different species. I'll, I'll let him give the pronunciation of the four different species, and uh, hopefully, if time permits, we're even going to try for the red deer, fallow deer, uh, maybe wild goat, whatever. So Gary asked me if there would be any chances of trying to um, get all four different species of Spanish Apex, which are Gredos, Southeast, Ronda, and the Vader. And, uh, well, it's not an easy deal because uh, bow hunting is way more challenging than rifle hunting. Once we get done with this, Gredos Apex, which I hope will be between today and tomorrow, probably, as soon as the weather clears up, we should get a good chance of of uh, getting a shot at a character we were looking And then we are heading downtown uh, to hunt for the southeast and Ronda species. And uh, the last one we will be hunting is the Bethate species. The reason we want to hunt Bethate lab is because the amazing season starts a little later than for the other three species, and we want to hunt them as back in the run as possible. But we are here hunting with the big help of Carlos, who's the master gamekeeper here, and Pepe, who's been a gamekeeper here for many years also. Both their families have been raised in this mountain range for several generations. Uh, Carlos' father in law was the gamekeeper when the royal family hunted here very often, and uh, their help will be very, very important to succeed on this hunt. Understand what we refer to a gameskeeper. It's almost what we at home know as a conservation officer. Uh, they protect the animals in this area as well as look after their total well being and they manage the numbers that are in the area so the numbers match the habitat. Uh, it's a unique system that we probably should pay more attention to back home. And as Giuseppe said earlier, they try to take the older, the mature, beyond maturity animals off. That's what we're hunting for. So you're gonna to get to see probably lots of animals on footage. And you'll say, why didn't they shoot? Why didn't they shoot? Well, most of the time we'll explain to you that maybe they were young, maybe they're right in their prime with breeding. Those are not the ones we want to remove. It's just like back home when we have quality management programs for whitetail. You don't want to shoot all the spikes and the two points and the four points. Get them up to four by five, four by fours and five by fives. And you want to get five or six years on them. Here, they're looking to have 10, 12, 13 years. I don't think anything like this has ever been put on film. And from my research, I think only about eight Spanish Ibexes have ever been taken uh, in modern history. That is modern history with bow and arrow. So. Uh, we're making our own little piece of history and adventure here, and I certainly hope that you enjoy this ball hunting adventure. While the hunters wait for the fog to lift, Gary gets the opportunity to learn a little about the area they're hunting, and also gets to enjoy some of the local delicacies like cured pork backstraps and the coarse textured local sausage. After a couple of hours, the fog clears sufficiently for Gary to get his first clear look at the beautiful countryside around him. It doesn't take long for Carlos and Pepe to spot an Ibex buck in the valley below. And where there is one Ibex, there are usually more.
seeing which way the Ibex is heading, the hunting party readies itself, and Gary's Spanish adventure truly begins. The first Ibex that Gary is hunting is called the Gritos Ibex, after the Gritos Mountains where it is found. These mountains lie about 100 miles west of Spain's capital city, Madrid, and reach an altitude of over 7,500 feet. The winters in this region can be surprisingly harsh, often with heavy snowfall and very low temperatures, while the summers are often very hot and very dry. It is this climate that has given the Gritos Ibex its most prized feature, the incredibly thick cape. The horns of the Gritos Ibex are in the shape of a leer, similar to that of an African impala. In Spain, SCI recognizes four subspecies of Ibex, each of which have obvious differences. Other species of Ibex are found throughout Europe, North Africa, and Asia, but they all have one thing in common, and that's that they all live in rocky, steep, unforgiving terrain. After climbing the side of the mountain in the fog for a couple of hours, the sight that Gary has been waiting for finally appears. A large herd of Gritos Ibex. It is the middle of the rut, the best time to hunt for Ibex, as the males and females are together, and there are a wide variety of trophies for Gary to look at. In Spain, you pay for the quality of the trophy that you take. The prices are related to the SCI medallion system, and a gold medal Ibex will cost an awful lot more than a record book but non-medallion trophy. Gary, as always, wishes to take an old buck. And while there are some huge Ibex trophies available, they are still young, only seven or eight years old, and prime breeders. Pepe and Carlos keep a careful eye on the herd through the shifting fog and use their years of experience to locate a potential shooter. Eventually, the fog lifts, and an old buck presents himself, allowing Gary his first shooting opportunity. The fog comes back in, though, and it becomes difficult for Gary to see his target. So rather than shooting, he waits for another opportunity. Giuseppe has obtained a permit to hunt the Gritos Ibex in the National Hunting Reserve of the Gritos Mountains. Originally, this area was the sole preserve of the Spanish royal family, and only they could hunt here. But Spanish history conspired against the royal family, and they were exiled in 1923, and Spain became a republic eight years later in 1931. Under the watchful eye of the descendants of the royal gameskeepers like Carlos and Pepe, this area is carefully managed to offer a superb variety of trophies. Giuseppe points out another ram to Gary. The shot is a little far, and Gary decides to risk getting just a bit closer. Gary had a tough shot over the top of a juniper bush, but the 100 grain mechanical Scorpion XP broadhead tipped on an Easton ACC 360 arrow hit the Ibex hard, but possibly just a bit high. Gary is hoping that it has clipped the top of the lungs, but only time will tell. Pepe and Carlos are quickly on the trail of the wounded Ibex and use a small dog to help follow the blood trail down the mountain. We're searching for the Ibex. The fog is just lifted. You can see it just within a couple of minutes, it just all of woof. And uh, so now we search. The dog came, brought him around the side of the mountain here, and all of a sudden the dog lost him. And uh, they don't know. We're hoping he didn't go across the plateau all the way to the snow mountain. Uh, but they don't think so. But there's a lot of thick stuff here. 
minutes. I just got to look. But we have two two more days on our permit to be able to hunt and look. We need just a little luck now. With the trail lost and the weather closing in one more time, the hunters have to make a difficult decision. Either try to stumble into the wounded ibex on the precipitous mountainside or return to the safety of the valley floor and follow up on the ibex when the weather improves. On reaching Giuseppe's SUV, Pepe and Carlos scan the valley sides. In the far distance, a single Ibex buck can be seen on a slab of rock. Is this the one that Gary has shot? The hunters decide to ascend the mountainside once more, hoping to be able to traverse in above the Ibex and see if it is possible to give Gary a second shot. It is the Ibex that Gary shot, and he is characteristically sticking to hard to reach places like rocky shelves and steep ledges that predators simply cannot reach. Although the Ibex is only seven or eight yards away, Gary just can't get a shot. The rocky ledges that the injured Ibex can still run up and down are too dangerous for the hunters, so they see where it is heading and then descend just a little to try to give Gary an upward shot. They're straight up, maybe 35 meters straight up there. 20 yard pin was wobbling, the wind was blowing the ball. And I got the 20 yard pin in, and the minute it kind of stopped wiggling a little bit, I let it go. But it went up through, and I'm not even sure. I saw the back of the arrow come up through the back. I need to thank these people with a great big, huge gratitude. I'm telling you, this has been a chase. I'm sure I lost 10 pounds. Fallen twice, smashed my elbow, but it was all worth it. It was a, it was one of all time great experience. Right, Joe? Why, but. Ah. No, no, <laughs> Thank you. My first Spanish Ibex, and I thought I was going to have heart failure. The stress level, the first arrow was just a teeny, teeny bit high. The second arrow, right through the chest and come out right here. From the big rocks over here to here, we have a beautiful. Now, tell us a little bit about this animal. Okay, this is she. How big is it? How old is it? Do you think? This is a full grown Ibex. The age is, look, you can cut them here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. 
11 years old, they count the rings like we do sheep in North America. He's done with with his breeding, mate. He's done with his breeding. Uh, and uh, I, I mean, he's an animal that we uh, need to shoot. He's not the best trophy in the whole herd, but he's done with his breeding. And I think you did a great thing killing him because he's done his job already. And there are some other animals there with probably better genes than he has, and, uh, the and, they, will, and they will do a better job. So, see, that's conservation. Hunting is playing an important role here even in Spain it, because these ibex are re a renewable resource and they need to be managed. And a tool is hunting. It brings in money. It helps the economy here. If we weed out the old, old, Mature ones, the young ones take over and pass on their genetics, and the herd gets better and better. Exactly, that's a big, that's a big. And I must tell that these people here, Carlos, Pepe, and all the other guys here, are doing an excellent, excellent job. And the preserve has improved a lot since 20 years ago that these people are taking care of it. After rapidly descending the mountain to avoid nightfall, Gary and Giuseppe return to the Parador de Grados, where they have been staying during their hunt. Relaxing in this opulent mountain retreat, Giuseppe describes the potential difficulties they might encounter on the next ibex on Gary's list, the Ronda ibex. It is an early start for Giuseppe and Gary the following morning as they leave the Parador and begin the long journey south to Motril on the Mediterranean coast, which will serve as their base for the hunt of the Ronda ibex. Motril is in the province of Andalusia, which is renowned for its subtropical coastal climate, cooler mountainous interior, the production of sherry, and for its most important feature, its Moorish architecture, including the Great Mosque of Cordoba and the Alhambra in Granada, two of Spain's finest monuments. They arrive late in the coastal town and an early night is in order for the 5 a.m. start the next day. The yes, the Ibex we're hunting for today. Its name, Ronda. R O N D A. Ronda. Ronda Ibex. Ronda Ibex. The Ronda Ibex is the smaller Ibex out of all the four species we have in Spain. And this is the one that lives close to the ocean. They live very close to the ocean. In fact, sometimes we see them right, right, right on top of the ocean. And uh, I mean, right next to the water. Right next. Okay. And. Uh, that was yesterday you were saying they'll come down and lick the salt off the rock. When the waves hit the rock, rocks, they, and, the, and the, tie, the tie goes down, yep. sometimes they, we see them licking the air. It's uh, because they live in a milder area, milder temperatures. They have much thinner cake, and uh, even the color is a little light brown. It's not as dark as Gredos or Pethete, not even the southeast. Yeah, so uh, I hope you uh, Enjoy some of the tips we'll give you along today and some of the action that hopefully we'll see take place. After breakfast, Gary and Giuseppe drive along the main coastal road to meet up with Alfonso Cabrera and guide Paco, who will accompany them for this leg of the hunt. While they're driving, Giuseppe points out that the hills rise steeply out of the sea and the few valleys that venture inland also have steep, rocky, unforgiving sides. It is in this thin zone that the majority of the Ronda Ibex are found, with a few herds in the Ronda Mountains to the west. A couple of bucks are spotted, and Gary decides to begin the day with a quick stalk. The largest buck remains well out of range of his Hoyt Protect bow, and Gary quickly realizes that these Rada Ibex may be a tougher proposition than the Greedos Ibex. They appear more wary of people and readily keep a good distance between themselves and any potential threat.
Gary and Giuseppe use another tactic to try to get close to another small herd of the Ronda Ibex. The gameskeepers guide them in below the Ibex by radio from the other side of the valley, while Gary and Giuseppe remain out of sight at the foot of the cliff. Again, however, the plan fails, and the hunters regroup to discuss a new strategy over lunch. We didn't get it on film. I'm sorry to say we just we blew a stalk up the mountain. We came back down the mountain very carefully. We'll have to be very careful. We came down around this big jetted like mound or mountain. It's steeper than I want to climb. Come around it and we came down here. And here, the big one was standing on the side here. We got to here in my first shot, hitting back just a little bit, but we didn't know for sure that it hit him until he started to run across there. And I could see some blood when he started running across there. And then it was a game of trying to get another shot. He came down off the mountain, just charging down, and I could never get on him. And he come down, he went over the wall, and he went down, but he, he was very sick. You can see the rock down there. The voter will show you. He stopped there. I shot two times or three times downhill and just could not tell. I still can't figure out, because the rock is there, what I was hitting. And the last one, I just tried to steady it, this thing, and got him right smack in the chest, right where the neck, I believe, and it just toppled him over. But he's down, and no matter how many arrows, a magnificent animal, uh, I can't wait to hold him in joy and appreciation this whole team, all have been helping me since daylight this morning, up and down the mountains, up and down the mountain little roads. They're like little mount mining roads in the mountains. It, I mean, so difficult. It's incredible. I hope, I'm sorry though, we didn't get it on film the way it was. It just, one more person, we may not have got the shot, but we're gonna show you what he really looks like up close in just a few minutes. And we just got the Rhonda Ibex and Kasebi's going to tell us a little bit about the area quickly and about this species of Ibex. Okay, this is the Ronda Ibex is the one that lives further south. It lives very, very close to the ocean. Therefore, the cape is lighter color and especially uh, thinner. It's not as thick because they live in a milder weather. The mating season for this species is almost over. The reason it's almost over is because uh, being a warmer weather, the spring here starts blooming by late February, early March. So the females have their little ones 
by that time, I would say mid to late March, so they mate earlier. This particular animal we've seen this morning, we've been uh, trying to get a good shot at him almost all day, and finally we saw him on top of a cliff, we managed to get close to him, and uh, Gary shot him at 44 meters. And he took him with the first shot, I believe this is the first shot, and uh, then he ran down the cliffs, we were worried he was going to drop in the in the ocean. In the ocean, and uh, we finally Gary put another three arrows on him when he was uh, fifty yards, maybe about thirty thirty about thirty five meters straight about down. About thirty five meters, but very very steep down. I would say over forty five degrees straight down, and so he finally painted over there, and. Uh, it took us a little time to bring him up here because it's pretty steep terrain, but there he is, and congratulations, Gary. Thank you, Kisapa. Congratulations. This, this is a fantastic outfitter. When you consider Spain, you want to consider this man right here. Thank you very much. He will give you an, a, an adventure, a true, true hunting adventure. Thank you. The following morning, Gary and Giuseppe head inland to the foothills of the Sierra Nevada Mountains, where they meet up with Alfonso once again, and gameskeepers Manolo and Gonzalo, who will use their local mountain knowledge to help Gary get Ibex number three, the Southeast Ibex. This morning, we've stopped for coffee at uh, one of the little cafes, just like we have. We call them a truck stop at home. They're the same here in Spain. Uh, you see the mountain backdrop this morning, we're going to go for the Southeast Ibex. For the Southeast Ibex. And uh, our two game officers are here. Yes. To uh, help us. Their names are Manolo and Gonzalo. Say that again. Manolo and Gonzalo. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but we're off to the mountains, and hopefully our luck and success will continue. The Sierra Nevada Mountains are the highest in contemporaneous Spain, reaching over 11,000 feet at the highest point, and offer winter skiing on the shores of the Mediterranean. These mountains saw ferocious fighting during the Spanish Civil War, and still bear the scars of the conflict some 70 years later. As they drive up to the mountains, they pass from the subtropical coastal woodland into temperate pine forests. The first of the southeast ibex is spotted, high on the edge of a cliff, It is a fine trophy, so Gary prepares himself, checking his equipment thoroughly for the hunt that is to come. There is no easy way up this cliff, though, so the team continues driving up the narrow mountain road. At about 6,000 feet, the hunters leave the vehicle and try to find the small group of southeastern ibex they saw from below. The going on this plateau is easier than on the coast the previous day and has a lot in common with hunting back at Arrowhead Lodge in Michigan. Easy going through cool, quiet woodland. On reaching the edge of the plateau, Gary and Giuseppe look for a few ibex they saw earlier. They spot the ibex, and moments later, the ibex are on to the hunters. Like most wild animals, all ibex have good hearing, smell, and incredible eyesight to enable them to avoid predators, which in Spain would mostly be the seldom seen wolves. Gary and Giuseppe begin to follow the ibex through the woods. On reaching the clearing, though, it is obvious that this herd has been alerted and the ibex are quickly making their way over the ridge.
Rather than return to the vehicle, though, the hunting party make their way along the edge of the plateau, hoping to run into one of the other herds known to live in this area. Eventually, they reach the end of the plateau, and it dives away steeply on three sides. The rocky outcrop is a superb vantage point and was used by soldiers during the Spanish Civil War of the 1930s. Gary's intentions, however, are far more peaceful, and as the valleys and hillsides are glassed, several large herds of southeastern ibex are spotted. The hillside, though, offers no cover to the hunters, so an approach would be pointless, and another plan is made. Gonzalo knows that the ibex will come to lower ground overnight when the temperatures at altitude will plummet to as low as 20 degrees Fahrenheit. He proposes that Gary and Giuseppe lay an ambush in one of the valleys and wait for the ibex to come down from the mountain. The ibex just came down off the mountain. It was incredible. All of them, they're females and little ones, and there must have been seven, eight males. And this guy was the lead male behind the females. So they came down oh, from high. And uh, I ran like mad, and motor grabbed, took his range finder in one hand, camera in the other. And uh, he gave me a, a reading, and I just quick took the shot. Very quickly, I, the, the animal was leaving. I, Look at that. <laughs> Southeastern Hybex. Yeah, we were, uh, we have sent this head about, I would say, five to 600 yards away. And we figured the way, uh, the place they were going to be coming to feed late in the evening. So we moved over here, kind of waited for them, and then we saw them. And uh, they were getting closer and closer and closer to us. We were figuring, we were uh, trying to look where playing kind of a game with them. And uh, we let them get closer and closer. Uh, we were kind of hiding a little bit in the bushes and next to the road. And then uh, they went across the road and uh, this beautiful animal gave Gary a chance to take a shot at him at 40 yards, was it Gary? About 35 yards. About 35 yards. And uh, for what I've seen, it must have been a, a hand shot because it went 30, 40 yards, right? Yeah, yeah, that's all. Just me, it made it up out of the gully. That's, that's all. It's a beautiful animal, as you can see, is way darker, the color and thicker cape than the one we shot yesterday. This is because this is cooler, higher terrain and cooler temperature. This is a nine-year-old animal, and it's a beautiful one. It's a beautiful trophy. Thank you. Thank you to you. Gary's success so far on this hunt has been down to good planning. 
good hunting areas, making use of the rut and a good dose of luck. The final ibex in the Grand Slam of Iberian ibex is the Bassetti's ibex. This species comes into rut about two or three weeks after the other three, so it's still a few days before they will begin to rut. Giuseppe has brought Gary to the slopes of the Toledo Mountains, 70 miles southeast of Madrid, owned by the Duke of Alcastanar, where Gary can try to take European wild boar, red deer, and mouflon sheep. Giuseppe has brought us to a, uh, a farm area. This farmer has some free-ranging mouflon sheep coming in every day towards the evening. They come in to uh, some feed that he's been putting out. We're gonna go set in a hide tonight, a stand type hide, and just see if maybe, maybe the mouflon sheep come in this late. There's a big front coming. The, the wind is whirling and swirling and blowing hard. It's supposed to get, dive down in temperature snow. Uh, it'd be nice if we could uh, get something because the next few days might be tough hunting than that. But we're gonna do our best tonight. And if we do, hey, lucky. The stand that Gary and Giuseppe are sitting in is at the foot of the Toledo Mountains. Here, the dense low brush of the hills gives way to the open, tough, rocky farmland. The farmland also has vineyards and numerous cork oak trees, which at this time of the year are dropping their acorns, a delicacy for the free roaming animals like the wild boar and the deer. Just before dusk, a herd of mouflon sheep come out of the hillside brush. The mouflon is found throughout Mediterranean Europe, from Cyprus in the east to Spain in the west. There is also an Asian mouflon species, mainly found in the mountainous regions of Western Asia. It is thought that both species are the product of early efforts at domesticating sheep in Iraq some 11,000 years ago. Those efforts were subsequently abandoned. The males can weigh up to 120 pounds, and the impressive horns can complete more than a full curl. Females rarely carry horns, and if they do, they tend to be very small. In this group of male sheep, there are two good mature rams, the one in the middle and the one to the right of your screen. The head-on and slightly quartering two shots, however, are poor shots, and Gary decides to wait patiently. After feeding quickly, the sheep begin to move on, the biggest being the first to go. Well, that was quite an evening for our first set. Uh, like I said earlier, the wind is really blowing here. There's a front coming in, but even so, we got to see uh, a roe deer come in off to the side that never really come in all the way. It started blowing and knew something was going on. Saw a big boar pig, but he never did come in. But we had eight mouflon sheep, which we were really after come in. And the lead one, when they came in, was a good male, that, and he was limping. And I think that limp is probably because they've been rutting and fighting. You know how sheep are, bam, bam, bucking heads and stuff, and their front legs take a real beating. Well, I had a quartering frontal shot, and I was not happy with that shot. They fed just a teeny bit and went, moved right on out, and a couple of them stopped at a water hole over 50 yards to our right, and they headed right back for the brush co country where they feel safe, especially in this wind. But it was exciting, an exciting evening. I just hope this weather now doesn't get so bad for the next two or three days that the hunting comes to a standstill. 
The following morning brings bad weather, and Giuseppe and Gary sit it out until mid-afternoon. And ah, yes, even here, I still use my scent blocker and my Robinson Lab products yep. to control the scent. And this is the Protec series that I'm using. It's with the fleece. Oh, man and perfect for this time of year. And it's also available in a heavier, a little heavier weight for colder conditions. <laughs> We're out to our stand. The wind's blowing a bit, but not as bad as last night. Today, he's put out kind of a green, not with a little few kernels of corn. So it's not corn, but it's more of a grain. Hopefully they will come tonight. Yes. He's lying down, he's lying down. He's lying down, what to make the noise? Ah, those, ah. There, it's away from him. Okay, it's all right. We're gonna go get our mouflin sheep. I've been here exactly seven days. This is the 
second day, we've hunted for the mouflon sheep. Second setting, I should say. We've been setting in the evenings because that's when they come down from the hills. I've hunted sheep, 21 sheep hunts, but I've never hunted the mouflon. And I had no idea how to gauge these for maturity, for the size of the horns. Please tell our friends a little about the mouflon sheep here in Spain or okay. Europe. They're all in Europe. Yeah, all, all over Europe. Yeah, all, all, all over Europe. The mouflon sheep likes to live here in Spain. They like to live in places where some rocks, that's where they feel comfortable. There's some bushes around. And then in the late evening, places where there are uh, oak trees like this, yes. they love to come and eat the acorns. They go crazy with the acorns. And as we knew that, that's why we were waiting here for them. We had a, a group of seven buffalo coming in, I believe it was seven. Uh, there was another one, suitable, good, that was narrower than this, narrower here with a, not as deep curls, and uh, maybe could flip up a little bit more, but the length is better on this one, because the uh, horns go deeper down, exactly, so you get more legs. This is a beautiful trophy. It's an eight-year-old sheep. Eight-year-old? Eight-year-old. So we have an eight-year-old sheep, and I hope you notice, like Giuseppe said, we had seven come in, and there was grain and corn for our bait, but five of them didn't even stay a couple of minutes, just like whitetails coming in, and they headed for those acorn trees. Exactly, exactly. They, this guy turned sideways, because he said to me, you know, take the right one, take the right one. Uh, he's good, and before he leaves. Well, my first buffalo on sheep, and uh, I'm very impressed with the terrain and the country and uh, the habitat they live in. And, these are free range. They go through all the local farms here in the area. They can go right through their small cattle fences. Congratulations for your accurate shooting. With the mouflon ready to be skinned, Gary and Giuseppe are returning to the farmhouse when a wild boar is spotted. male boar. I didn't think we'd get a chance at one and we just made a shot. He ran up here in the bushes and uh, squealing and I think he's down but I think we haven't seen him yet. We have a Spanish pig or a European pig, free ranging, a nice young boar. This is called a Spanish pig or is it oh, European? European wild boar. European wild boar. And this is a young male? This is a male about three years old. They come out in the evenings to feed in these acorns, just as other animals do, same as the mouflon. And he was here all by himself. And we were lucky enough to get close to him. And he knew something was going wrong, so he moved away. And he was standing behind the bush. The bush. But you could only see, I would say, the neck and maybe another three or four inches. Just and enough. I, <laughs> but I think the arrow went right through the neck. Perfect shot. It so. took maybe, what, 50, 60 steps? That's about it and he started flipping and jumping and he just rolled over. I, did, I never thought we would stop a pig that quick. You, you know, friends of mine that hunt pigs back home, they shoot these things and sometimes they run a mile. They're, they're, they're so strong, their legs, I mean, their lungs, their heart. If you don't get a really, really good shot on them, at home they say, you know what? This shot could not have been any better. I mean, oh no, no, right, I agree. Right in the spot. Well, that, 
was a 70 pound white Protac with an Easton ACC 360. And yes, I was using a mechanical head, a Scorpion XP by NAP, 100 grain. We were getting about 270 out of the bow. Uh, and it did the job on a wild pig. And thank you. It did a hell of a job. <laughs> Well, it's bright and early this morning on Sunday morning, and uh, we've had a couple guys out scouting the mountains for two days looking for wild goats. Now, what are wild goats? They're not like the North America goat. They're feral goats or common goats that have just been either turned loose years and years ago or broke away from a herd and live by themselves in the mountains totally unkept whatever and become just totally wild. Mm -hmm. uh, there's not a lot of them. Uh, they have saw just one or two in this area and they think they've located one. So um, it's uh, about uh, 8.30 in the morning. We've got a heavy frost. There's almost no wind. Uh, perfect conditions. I've got my fleece on and stuff. We're going to try to get in close enough, get a shot um, and see if we can't get a wild feral goat. Bad. In Spain, as Gary says, wild or feral goats are those that have escaped or been released to live on their own. Gary's guide, Garibato, quickly points out the goat standing proud on the top of a hill. Although wary of man, having been wild for many, many years, this goat does not run. He just keeps an eye on the approaching hunters. It was only about 22 yards, and I shot a bit low, and uh, that's unusual. I'm normally shooting high, but I shot low, and uh, the goat ran off and down the hill, and we're going to give it uh, 15, 20 minutes, and then we're going to start trying to follow it down. I, I'm sure I hit it, but it, but it's a little bit of a low shot. Ah, there, right there. Holy mackerel, 20 yards from me. I'm looking all over in the brush and I can't even see it. And it's down right here. It's, it's fur just makes it blend right in. Feral goat from Spain. Even got holes, its ears are holes in its ears, rips in its ears. Tells you this thing has been wild and out here a long time and been fighting. Um, yes, they come with longer horns than these, uh, but uh, it's still, it's a, uh, it's a good goat, a good feral goat. 
How old would you say? Um, uh, you can't tell. But uh, I was trying to count the rings. Yeah. It was one, two, three, four, five, six, seven or eight years old. Seven or eight years old. So he's older than I. I looked at his teeth and they looked like they were, you know, beginning to wear. Yeah. Well, these animals, as I said, there are very, very, very few left here. And uh, they get, at night, they go to these uh, cereal fields. Um, and they get very good food, so that's, they don't get out of this brush too much. Too huh? much, so that's why they wear off the teeth very much. Okay. All right, and is this on feral goats? Is this about like what the horns do? Yeah, they, well, you get all, all kind of shapes. You cut them this way, they, they're all kind of twisted. But you cut them more straight up, more spread out. You cut them all, all kind of shapes. In different. And you find them in different, different parts of Spain? Yes, uh, they have them in the Pyrenees, here. They have them in the in the Baleares island. In fact, SCI just introduced a new species. The book is called the Baleares bok, which is this exactly the same animals uh, living in the wild in the Baleares island, in the Mediterranean Sea. And uh, it's exactly the same thing. These, these are free-ranging goat uh, that live in these hills and that. So uh, uh, come to Spain. I encourage you. Have a great adventure with Concepi and, uh, and have fun. And have memories to take home that'll last forever. Good hunting. It's Sunday morning. We've been out hunting for a while on the goat hunt. It's mass time now. It's 1030. This beautiful little church is right on the fire, farm here and we're a few minutes late and we're going in for mass. Like many European countries, the dominant religion in Spain is Roman Catholicism. The Catholic Church in Spain built up a frightening reputation from the 16th to the early 19th century when the Spanish Inquisition held sway not only over the church, but also the monarchy, persecuting other religions and executing thousands of alleged heretics. This particular church was built just after the end of the Inquisition by the Duke of Alcastanar's great-grandfather for all the staff who worked for him, a service which it still serves today. After Mass, Gary and Giuseppe go out into the Duke's property to look for red and fallow deer. Their first plan is for Gary to sit in a blind built into some large rocks. But with no bait such as grain, they simply must wait and see what walks past. The rocks provide an excellent natural cover for Gary, and there is plenty of sign on the soft earth. But after an hour without seeing a single animal, it's time to change plans. We're going to just hide behind this brush and rocks here. They're going to do a little push and see if they push the uh, fallow deer and red deer kind of through where the fence is down a bit right here. Well, we had a short stay here. They did a little push with the animals. Uh, the normal thing didn't cooperate. We thought they'd come into the wind, but in this case, they went uh, sort of up the mountain into the high, thicker brush country instead of going into the wind and coming through where the down fence was. So uh, uh, it was a good experience though for us, and uh, we're gonna try some other things. It is important for bow hunters to always use their imagination to think up likely ways to get to their quarry, especially when the weather is working against them. Today, the wind appears to be blowing from all directions. So, as demonstrated, a blind will not be very successful, and the driven hunt has also failed. 
Gary and Giuseppe's final plan for the day is to try to locate the herd of red deer from a vehicle and then, if possible, make an approach on foot. Giuseppe has just spotted a bull that's behind the rest of the herd. We saw it from way out in the field. and We've made it to the road here. He's going to take us up this hill a ways here now. We're going to try to get in somewhere 30 to 40 yards for a shot. Okay. Okay. It's good. Now we have to walk very slowly. And when he looks, we've got to stop and just take the time. If it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. Okay. I understand. We got the wind in our face. Giuseppe just put me on a red stag, a Spanish red stag. Um, we have a wonderful trophy, or and uh, I'm really interested to hear what Giuseppe says when he looks at him about the age and maturity and tells us a little about him. But right now, I just want to go hold his horns and admire him for a few minutes because it's uh, we've worked hard for this. We did. We worked. We worked very hard for this. This is another chapter in our Spanish, uh, or our Spain adventure, I guess you would call it, bow hunting adventure. We put in quite a number of outings trying to get a red deer. It certainly isn't easy this time of year because the rut is over. And Giuseppe told me, if they're not in the rut, it's practically impossible. We will have to bait, we'll have to try to trick them, we'll have to do whatever it is we can do. But again, how can I say, it seems like Giuseppe pulled a bit of magic out of his little pocket <laughs> and he worked it, sprinkled something on it. But now, I want Giuseppe to tell you a little bit about this animal. His horns may not be big as some, but to me, they're magnificent. And partly because you know I believe my favorite requirement is maturity. We are here again in the Toledo Mountains. This is a very, very old stack. Well, uh, I would say eight or nine years old. It's been fighting very tough during the rut. You can tell he's got this one time, two times over there, that one broken, the ear turned down to pieces, this other time broken, this other one. We saw that, we saw that before we shot him. Uh, but being a very mature stag, that's, uh, and Gary very clearly explained me, he was more interested in a mature trophy than in a big, big record book one. This uh, animal gave us an opportunity and uh, Gary decided to, to take a shot at him. And he took, a, he took a perfect shot for all of you who know about Spanish red deer. This is a very big body size one. It's a mature, totally mature red deer. It's a pity, it's a little broom off. This red deer has been bigger than it is now. 
uh, 20% loss in body weight. 15 no, to 20% yeah, yeah. because of the rut. Yeah, but I'm, I said it, last year it had a bigger rack than it has oh, this year. Okay, bigger uh, rack last year. I explained you, Gary, that we went this year through a big drought in Spain. Right. And uh, this has obviously affected all angler animals uh, because they grow their rack between, I would say, March and July. And uh, if they're not very, very heavy and they have a lot of fat reserves in that time period, that goes directly into the rack. Can thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations. Gary is traveling east with Gonzalo Colomina, the Castellotti, and Bassetes Mountains, about six hours from Madrid, in search of the most difficult of the Spanish ibex, the Bassetes ibex. This species of ibex entered the rut slightly later than the other species that Gary has hunted, and it is believed to have just started. The Bassetes ibex, like the other three, lives in steep, rocky, and unforgiving mountainous terrain, and they can be very, very difficult to locate. The hunters are able to drive a long way up the valley, and at the roadhead, the local gameskeepers, Jose and Carlos, decide that the only way from here is up by foot, as there is not a single ibex in sight on the steep, rocky hillsides. The narrow trail provides some magnificent scenery for the hunters, and after an hour or so's hike, the first ibex are spotted in the distance. Gary and Gonzalo are playing catch up to the fleet-footed ibex, who neither use trails nor seem to care much about the drops at their sides. Jose spots more ibex in the valley below, a fantastic buck in their midst. This buck is the perfect trophy for Gary. According to Jose, he is just about finished breeding and will only live a couple more years. With this in mind, and knowing how tricky it is to get close enough to the Bassetti's ibex, the gameskeepers make a plan and try to get Gary as close as possible to the ibex. We have two males down there, one larger than the other. They were up on top of the mountain. They've already copped down, covered down. You know, and the, the winds in our face. Um, they seem to think they may be able to get around behind them and push them this way. I don't. I don't think they're going to go downwind. I think they want to go into the wind. That's just what they've done. I don't know if I could get to that point. I might be within distance. It will be very close. Yes, I mean, like. I don't know. It'd still be a long, long shot, but... The gameskeepers make roundabouts to the valley floor. Their objective is to drive the ibex up the valley to its narrow end and give Gary a shot. Gary waits patiently, concerned about the funneling effect in the gorge and how it may affect the arrow in flight if a shot is offered. The gameskeepers' plan is working, and Gary spots a superb ibex buck running along the opposite gorge wall. He sticks to the rock wall, feeling secure on the narrow edge, seemingly knowing that his pursuers just can't get to him there. Gary is using an 80-pound Hoyt Protect bow with Easton ACC 371 arrows and a 125-grain NAP Scorpion XP broadhead to try to get the Bassetti's Ibex, and he feels if the buck comes to a stop, he will have a great opportunity. Long ways away. Just in my range, and I took a shot. It was right at my limit, and uh, uh, with the wind and stuff, just uh, I think it was just over it.
Gary and his guides continue up the valley to a plateau where the Ibex ran after the shot. Eventually, they are spotted in the distance grazing away from the hunters in very open country. With this herd already on edge, Jose and Carlos decide it will be better to leave them alone and try to find another herd. The hunters begin the long walk back to the road. Fortunately, much of it is downhill and the scenery is breathtaking. And it's not as hard on the legs as going up. Rather than returning to the SUV, Gary, Gonzalo, Jose, and Carlos walk down the gravel road. Another small herd of Ibex is spotted, and once again, the chase is on. But the Ibex again have the edge over the hunters. Their agility and ability to move over steep ground enabling them to quickly disappear from view. The Bassetti's Ibex is beginning to prove that he is tough to get, being very wary and extremely agile. As late afternoon approaches, Gary begins to realize the true challenges of hunting Ibex and that this hunt may take as long as the others combine. Beside Ibex. Right here on the side of this hill when we come around the corner. There was some a couple small ones with a nice ram. They hit him at 41, 45 yards over here. And he started up and he stopped on top of that rock just for a split second. And I was on him and I let it go and I didn't see the arrow. I thought I hit it. I think I hit it. Voter says in the viewfinder, we got a hit. but it went uphill a little bit and turned left and went that way. <sighs> wow. I, I, it's like, <sighs> can't believe it, it all happened so fast. Jeez almighty. Now I gotta draw a climb up there. Always. Oh, well done. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. <laughs> it made it to here. Look at this. It rolled back down the hill. We walked right by it. It blends in so. Plus, it's lots of sun. Incredible. But look at the view in this camera. You can see how high we've come. And this animal has been hemorrhaging. So, thank you. Thank you, which is gosh. Thank you. I don't know how big they are. I don't care how big they are. It's ours. And we work hard for him in age one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Yeah, okay. Uh, 10. This Peter two. Two? Two, yeah. 10. 10 years old. Yeah. Mature animal. Good, mature animal. As you all know, that's so important to me. We have a good, 
beautiful, mature animal. I'm gonna prop him up here on the, on the rock quickly so you can get a better picture. And I don't know what to say, but thank you to the heaven. Yeah. Because tell us a little bit about this species. Okay, uh, this is a species of, of ibex in Spain. This is Besete ibex. This is a quite old one. It's at least 10 years old. He got a couple of two years, very bad growth. Have some hits in the horns in the side, so it's an animal who have fight a lot. Uh, probably it's not a huge one, but even if it's a one, then we have the option to shoot, and we got a very good shot. So we have a great mature animal. Yeah, that is. Past his prime in breeding. Yep. That's what I want. I'm so happy. This is our fourth species of ibex here in Spain. We come trying to do what I called the grand slam of the four ibexes. I'm not sure I really, really thought we could do it. Voter was upbeat more than I was trying to be positive, but we did give it our all. And when we had three down, I couldn't believe it coming into the fourth hunt. And I knew we had a good 10 days available to us. That's right, 10 days. I planned on making a commitment to hunting this species and to get it the first evening is just incredible. Just absolutely incredible. But I think somebody upstairs has been watching over us. They know Voter needs to get back to South Africa as quickly as possible to be with his family and give them support. And I want to thank him for hanging in there the last 48 hours knowing. I want to thank my wife. She's been a saint for hanging in there with me and knowing and giving me her blessing on this hunt. And Kasepi, I want to thank you because none of this would have been possible if you hadn't made the, the all-out effort and commitment trying to get seven animals on this trip, four of them Ibexes. And to all you out there that are looking for a bow hunting adventure, I encourage you to consider Spain someday. And it will be an adventure. It's not just the animals, it's the country, the history, the people. Come like a sponge and you'll go home full, I promise you with many, many stories to share with your fellow hunters. Hello. Well, I hope you've enjoyed our Spain adventure. I can tell you it was thrilling. It was a great adventure. The hunting was different than I'm accustomed to in North America, but the traditions and the passions um, still the same with the people. Yes, the techniques are different, but they have hundreds upon hundreds, they have centuries compared to our country in the United States in hunting. But even here in Spain, they don't take hunting for granted. They know it's not a God-given right, it's not in their constitution. They know they have to fight for it every day as we do at home. Conservation of wildlife, they don't take it for granted. They're very active with their programs. They have good numbers in most of their animals, their wildlife animals, but they manage them and hunting is a tool that they use also in this country, in Spain, to control the numbers. Yes, wildlife is a renewable resource. Hunting is a tool in managing it. Now saying all that, please don't forget what I said in the beginning. There's no guarantees. There's nothing in our constitution about you have the right to hunt. We do not. We must protect that right. And only one organization that I'm familiar with, SCI, right here, SCI, First for Hunters. I encourage you today, join SCI. Join it nationally or find a chapter in your area and join that chapter. You don't have to be an adventurous traveling around the world. You can be a wing shooter, a small game hunter, or just hunting good old whitetails back home on the back 40. Do yourself a favor, protect hunting for our children and our grandchildren and all those to follow. Now. I wish you good hunting and God bless.